The following is an extended product spotlight paid for by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Hey everyone, I'm Sean Haney, host of Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM, as well as founder of Real Agriculture. And I'm here to welcome you to the fourth episode of the Canola Podcast, sponsored by Invigor Hybrid Canola from BSF. The series was designed to highlight useful tips and tricks growers can bring to their canola fields to help make every acre count. On today's episode, we're tackling myths about canola seed performance. And here with me to break down the topic is Rob McDonald. He's the manager of agronomic excellence at BSF. Welcome, Rob. Morning, Sean. It's great to chat with you. Okay, so Rob, let's get to it here. I'm looking forward to this topic. It's, it's a very, very important one. We're trying to get that seed out of the ground as evenly and timely as possible to get some of those ideal yields. The, the idea or myth that's going around right now is that seed size affects performance. Is it true that smaller seed doesn't perform as well as maybe the larger seed? Well, it's a good question, Sean, because, you know, there's actually some truth to that in that really small seeds, and I'm talking tiny seeds, really don't perform. But where the myth falls apart is that there's an idea that as seed gets bigger, it gets better. And that's not true. Our research and, and a lot of complementary researchers done by other scientists has really demonstrated that there's more of a threshold in seed size that impacts performance. So it's the really small seed that doesn't perform. And what do I mean by really small seed? Well, we're talking about seeds like 3 gram TSW, 3.5 gram TSW. These are the seeds that we used to handle 15 years ago. Like when we talk about, uh, say, the early days with Polish canola, these were really tiny seeds. And these were more of a challenge to get these small seeds out of the ground. And they just didn't perform. The product we're bringing to the market is so different than the product from 10, 15 years ago that it really changes the dynamic about this, this whole seed size myth. Okay, so considering that some of these really small seeds may underperform, do, do any of these underperforming seeds actually make it into the Invigor bag, or do you have a way of ensuring that doesn't happen? Well, that's been a really important part of the research that we've been doing, is trying to determine how do we put the most consistent performing and high-performing seeds into the bag of Invigor. And, uh, you know, we've really developed a refined conditioning process to remove those smaller underperforming seeds from the bag. And, you know, we, we don't have to look any further than some research that was, you know, sponsored by the Canola Council, uh, published by uh, SAS, uh, SAS Canola, that demonstrated regardless of the seed size uh, for the Invigor uh, two Invigor seed lots that were tested, they had the same performance throughout the season from emergence through establishment right through to, to final yield that we get that consistent performance independent of seed size. So Rob, g- getting back to this even performance, no matter the seed size, h- how do we know this? Like, uh, How do you know that all your seed size ranges will actually perform at the same level so that when I'm going to my retail, I'm like, I want this size because I know this gives a higher yield. If that's not the case, how do we know it? Well, you know, it's taken a lot of research, a lot of effort uh, to to prove that point out. Because, you know, before we came to the market with Invigorate and with our different uh, seed sizes, you know, from the A through D, we wanted to have full confidence in that product that we're bringing to the market. So we've got about five years of data of really intensive field trials comparing the whole range of our seed sizes. And we've done this for multiple years, multiple locations in replicated trials. And this is the one thing that comes out consistent in our studies is equivalent performance. Even in our uh, uh, demonstration tours that we do uh, in the field season where we get growers out and, and, and uh, to look at the trials. We'll put the different seed size ranges side by side in the field, let the growers walk through and have them tell us which size seed they think they're looking at and compare. And most often they pick wrong, you know, it's, it's the, uh, and uh, it, it, it's kind of an entertaining exercise, but 
you know, we just see really equivalent performance between the uh, these different seed size ranges, both in the trials, in these demonstrations, and in the hands of our customers. Yeah, it's it's kind of like athletes. The size doesn't matter. It's it's the heart that counts, I guess. But so I got to ask this: Why even go down this direction then with seed sizes? And isn't it just making things more complicated for producers to calibrate something like their seeder? You know, that, that question comes up quite often as well. Are we making things more complicated than they need to be? And the reality is quite different. You know, before we went to these four seed size ranges, you know, I, I can think back to years where we had, say, in our product offering, we had over 20 different TSWs in a huge range. So a grower would go to retail, pick up his seed, and he could have multiple different thousand seed weights in the bag anywhere from four to six and uh and everything in between and really to get awesome performance he'd need to calibrate for each different lot that he was handling for that specific tsw invigorate and bringing together these four ranges actually simplifies the calibration for the grower breaks it down to four simple calibrations that he needs to perform and in often cases the grower can just get one seed size range and which really further simplifies things having one calibration. So uh, although it, you know, it sounds like we're making things more difficult with these different ranges, it's actually simplifying things for the grower. Just moving to, you know, a 10 acre bag and four seed size ranges to simplify calibration for the grower. It doesn't change the fact that it's super important to calibrate. This is the most important step the grower can do preparing for seeding. Yeah, it's that KISS method, right? Absolutely. Okay, so what about the, a planter? Okay, because we're, we're seeing more and more growers thinking about or have been using a planter to put their canola in the ground. Is, is there one range of seed size that's more suitable for use in a planter? Yeah, like uh, planters are gaining in popularity. And, uh, uh, you know, there can be some real benefits to, to using a planter for seeding canola, particularly as related for getting improvements in the consistency of seed depth. And, uh, but we have to keep in mind one thing with planters is they weren't built for handling canola. So that's, that's the first thing to keep in mind. The sensors that on them are, that are built into them are, were built for larger, coarser seeds. They're built for corn and soybeans. And canola seed is significantly smaller than, than those. That's no secret. So first thing to keep in mind is you can't necessarily trust that sensor. So does that create challenges for calibration? You bet it does. Because, see, with a corn or soybean, the grower can just rely on that seed sensor. It's going to give them an accurate picture, really simplifies calibration. With canola, regardless of seed size, you've got an additional hurdle of, of challenge with the sensor that's on, on the machine. That creates some additional challenges. The other is the planter units themselves weren't built. Like the discs, uh, while the discs have been modified uh, to handle canola seed sizes, the system itself wasn't built uh, uh, or tailor-made for handling small seeds. So that just creates additional challenges. So calibration becomes very, very important to get that uh, accurate population down. And that really goes independent of seed size. You can, you can make a mess of calibration with your planter kind of regardless of seed size. So uh, what I see is, it, is there one seed size that's better than another? Uh, we've had success planting canola with our full seed size range between four gram and six gram uh, TSW. That, that, that's working quite well with the discs that are over. But as I mentioned, super important to get the calibration right. Don't trust that seed center. Do, you know, do, a, do a good calibration to make sure you're hitting target. So w- while we're talking about the precision of all of this, the other topic that comes to mind is depth. Because that's an important component, too, to get that seed launched out of the ground as quickly and evenly as possible to get that ideal emergence to stay on that optimum yield curve. What have you been seeing in some of your research when it comes to depth? Uh, Great question, uh, Sean, because really ties into this whole discussion on seed size and, and generally myths 
uh, about canola because the you know for a long time the you know the real adage for uh, seeding canola and everybody remembers it you know uh, shallow up and slow down so you know trying to highlight the advantages of shallow seeding canola because it's a small seed right so why wouldn't you want to seed it shallow well in some dry seasons that we've experienced you you learn pretty darn quickly that there can be some real challenges with shallow seeding and stranding seeds in a dry seedbed. So we've been, you know, very active in this area of trying to identify, you know, important um, targets for seeding depth and not just going with trying to seed as shallow as possible. In fact, we're finding that it's important. Number one uh, important thing is consistency of depth. That's, 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 you know, that's very, very important. We want to get that crop up as evenly as possible. Second, is we want to actually keep those seeds out of the most shallow range. And that, that top layer, that top layer, I, I call it the kill zone because that top layer gets so hot. It's, you know, the organic matter is desiccated in that top quarter inch. We've got to keep seeds out of there. You know, back, back 15, 20 years ago, when I first started seeding canola, the, we wanted to see some seeds on the surface. If, if we didn't have seeds on the surface, we felt we were too deep. Now, uh, we know that seeing seeds on the surface, that's just a waste of money. So we're targeting deeper depths. But, you know, don't want to get in a long discussion on seed depth. You know, I think the best way to talk about seed depth is to get out to the field, have a look, come to, come to some of our demonstration sites, have a look at seeding depth demos and see what the real impact is of seed depth and, and uh, basically how in your seed forms, how these different seed uh, a size range perform at different seeding depths and uh, see them firsthand. We can talk about it all day, but seeing it firsthand is really, uh, is really of great value. Hey, great stuff. Hey, Rob, thanks so much for joining me here today. My pleasure. Thanks, Sean. We want to wish everybody out there all the best this spring. Encourage you to go to canolaschool.com. Work very closely with BSF on that project. Provides you with 30 agronomic videos throughout the growing season. So please check that out. And thanks for listening.